Hello everyone. Uh, if you remember, we had a couple of videos that I published on the channel about 3D uh, kinematics and kinetics. And in those, if you remember, we used the absolute angles theta x, theta y, theta z of uh, the coordinate system attached to the rigid body uh, that they make compared or with respect to the absolute system and then uh, the time derivative of those we call omega x omega y omega z so the angles we used were absolute angles of the object with respect to the uh, inertial system and the Euler equations which are the equations of uh, rotation they were described in terms of the derivatives of those angles right so all you need is to just go back and look at these 3D kinetics and 3D kinematics equations and the Euler equations that uh, we have derived and used over there. Now, in general, in dynamics and in many other applications, such as um, like aerospace, uh, air, aircraft, um, basically, um, they call it attitude control, and robotics and so on, the only way to show the orientation of a part is not using those three absolute angles. There are several ways that most of the time are preferred over those absolute angles. And uh, they are like, we call them axis angle representation, we call them Euler angles, we call them rotation matrix, and uh, quaternions, unit quaternions. Okay, so these are the common ways to um, represent the orientation of a part and uh, one of the common one common ones that is used a lot in engineering and different applications are these intrinsic rotations called Euler angles and by intrinsic I mean each rotation is with respect to the current frame axes not the absolute so the angles here are not absolute they are relative and um, I'll give you an example first, and then we talk about different types of Euler angles, different uh, sequences, basically, and then how we analyze the uh, kinematics here, and then how we go to uh, kinetics using these Euler angles, and we de derive the Euler equations, and uh, ultimately, we look at some applications, too. So uh, here, if you look, I have this initial object and this initial object here I have two frames shown on it the one is cap X cap Y and cap Z and these are the inertial frame they don't move they are earth atta attached to the earth and then I have the small X small Y and small Z frame now um, here what I do is um, I first rotate, now the, this XYZ frame here uh, is not inertial and it's not even completely attached to the rigid body, so it's not body attached, okay? What is it? I'll tell you, but just uh, at the moment, assume that they are on the top of each other, but XYZ small can move and rotate, XYZ capital does not. So the first thing we do is we rotate the rigid body with respect to the uh, cap Z uh, axis, an angle of psi, okay? This angle, which is one of the uh, Euler angles, the first Euler angle, we also call it precision. Okay, so it's not precision, it's precision. And um, when we do that, now the intermediate coordinate frame that results from this rotation of psi about cap z we call it x prime y prime and z prime then instead of rotating the result about the absolute x-axis now i'm going to rotate about this intermediate x prime axis so you see if they were theta x theta y theta z the first one is like an absolute theta z, fine. But the second one 
if instead of the rotating about cap x, I rotate it about this intermediate current x-axis, which is called x prime, that means those angles are relative to the current frame. And in terms of um, uh, in terminologies of robotics, we call them intrinsic or extrinsic. So uh, this is gonna, gonna be the intrinsic angle. So now, as I said, you are going to rotate about this X prime axis, an angle of theta. When you do that, your X prime is gonna stay the same, but your Y prime and Z prime are going to rotate both by angle theta. So your Y prime is now going to a new axis, we call it Y, and your Z prime is rotated to a new axis, we call it what? Z, okay? So that's that X, Y, Z that I mentioned. Now you see that your X, Y, Z can move with respect to the uh, inertial frame. And the motion of it comes from two rotations. First, Psi, then Theta, okay? And we call the resulting coordinate frame, we call it X, Y, and Z small. And now, the la by the way, this angle Theta, that basically tilts the object, we call it the nutation angle. Okay, and finally, in this nutated position, I'm going to rotate again about the current Z axis. You see, I'm not again going to rotate it about the absolute Z, the cap Z. I'm going to rotate it about this small Z axis, a new angle of phi, which we call the spin angle. And uh, this spin angle is the last of the three Euler angles, which we call, as I said, the spin angle. Now, so you see that the Euler angles are three angles, psi, theta, and phi, precession, nutation, and spin angles. Now, as I said, there are other ways to represent the orientation of the object, okay? There is rotation matrix, which is a three by three matrix. And um, I'm going to publish a video very soon where I talk with, in more details about the uh, different ways to represent the orientation of an object. And one of the reasons many people use Euler angles is that Euler angle representation is not redundant. What do I mean by redundant? Well. As I said, one way to show the um, uh, orientation of the part is using a 3x3 three three matrix, okay? We call it the rotation matrix, and this rotation matrix, which we are going to talk about it, by the way, in this video, this rotation matrix has nine elements. Well, as you know, in the space, a rigid body has only three degrees of freedom for rotation, so ideally, all that you need to specify the orientation are ideally three numbers because you have three degrees of freedom. But you see, this guy has nine entries, nine values. So six of them are, uh, you can call them, uh, not six of them redundant, but there are six constraints between these numbers, okay? So out of the nine numbers, we only need three. We can call six of them. We don't... We don't tell exactly which one, but six, there are six redundant parameters when you use a rotation matrix to specify the orientation. Also, when you have the axis angle representation, use a unit vector K and use an angle theta, where this unit vector K, this is another way to represent the uh, orientation. It has three components, Kx, Ky, and K z okay so that's three parameters plus theta that's four parameters so one of them is redundant and that goes back to the fact that this is a unit vector or if you do unit quaternions then again you have uh, four parameters q1 q2 and q3 again it's a unit so there is a constraint but you have used four parameters to specify three rotations while the euler angles are simply what psi theta and phi. So this is the only representation out of these four major representations that does not have any redundancy. 
it only uses exactly as many parameters as the degrees of freedom. So that's one of the reasons uh, many people like Euler angles because they are, uh, first of all, easy to visualize. And I'll show you a code right now and I'll show you how to um, work with it. But not only they are easy to understand, they are also uh, not redundant. Not everything is easy to understand, okay? Rotation matrices are the best. I mean, if in terms of understanding rotation, I would say rotation matrices are absolutely the best. And uh, then axis angle is not too bad. It's the matter of just uh, uh, all these three rotations. Uh, summarize it into one single rotation, but about an axis that is not x-axis, not y-axis, not z-axis. Quaternions are the hardest to understand. They are like a, a generalized complex number, and uh, it's hard to visualize and understand the uh, meaning of them. They are the most stable, and what is a stable? Again, I'll, I'll tell you in those videos. They are the most stable, the one with the... Uh, no singularity again what is singularity i talk about it don't worry but in this video i'm not going to go over all of those important details that are just for orientation representation so as i said in terms of understanding they are relatively nice understanding and in uh, in terms of understanding and also they are not redundant so that's why some people use them they have a problem of singularity which uh again we'll talk about it later but uh, you clearly can see that first I do a rotation of Z, then current X, and then again current Z. That's why the sequence of these three angles, I call it the ZXZ sequence. And that's not the only way that you can rotate your initial uh, part to the final orientation. There are so many other orientations of uh, Euler angles, as you can imagine, you don't have to go Z, X, Z. Maybe you first do the absolute Z, but the next one, instead of rotating about X prime, maybe you rotate about the current Y, which is called Y prime here, and then again, go back about the final Z. Then you call that sequence Z, Y, Z, which is one of the most common sequences of Euler angles. So, um, there are different sequences, let me show you, about Euler angles. There are 12 of uh, different sequences of Euler angles. One category of them, the first and the last axis are the same type. Not that they are the same thing, of course not. The first one is the absolute, the last one is an intermediate. But the letters, the type of the axis, if you look, the first one and the last one are the same. So it is ZXZ or ZYZ, right? Or it's XYX or XZX. Or YXY or YZY, okay? So the first and the last two axes are the same type. These set of the six combinations, six sequences, we call them proper Euler angles. There is also another version, another sequence where none of the three are the same type. So it's uh, always there is X, Y, and Z in all of them. But which one comes first, which one goes next, which one goes last, that creates six other sequences, which we call them Tate-Bryan angles. Okay, so clearly you see X, Y, and Z are in all of them, but the order is different. Okay, the, sometimes also they call these uh, Tate-Bryan angles yaw, pitch, and roll, which you use in airplanes to define the orientation of the airplane, right? As you know, in an airplane, if I can draw an airplane for you, now I'm not the best at drawing, but uh, if you have an airplane like this, so, um, the rotation about this longitudinal axis, okay, we call it roll, correct? The lateral rotation, so one wing goes down, one wing goes up, or vice versa. The rotation about this transverse axis, like this, 
which makes the nose of the airplane to go up, the tail to go down, or the other way, we call it pitch. And finally, the rotation about the axis that is perpendicular to the plane. Okay, so this axis is perpendicular to the plane, right? The rotation about this guy, we call that yaw. So you see clearly the rotations are about three perpendicular axes. None of the two are about the same type of axis. That's why these guys are also called uh, yaw pitch roll. And as I said, we use them in airplanes to define the orientation of the airplane. But uh, not everybody in every application is using them. Many times in robotics, we use proper Euler angles. And we use most of the time like ZYZ sequence or ZXZ sequence. It does not matter really too much which sequence you are using. The reason is with each and every one of them, you are able to go from an initial orientation to what? To a given arbitrary final orientation. So if I give you an initial and a final orientation with any of these sequences, you should be able to reach the final orientation. So which sequence you choose is not as critical, okay? So here, as I said, I showed you the ZXZ sequence, the three angles, the name of them, and everything. Good. Now, uh, as I mentioned, in the case of this analysis, the cap XYZ is inertial. The X prime, Y prime, Z prime is an intermediate uh, frame. Also, the XYZ small is an intermediate because it does not have the final rotation with angle phi in it. Okay, so this spin angle is not uh, basically a part of the XYZ. So, um, let me write that down for you here. The cap XYZ is inertial. And X prime, Y prime, Z prime, and X, Y, Z are not inertial, or they are moving, they are rotating. They are, let me call them intermediate. Frames. And with respect to this last intermediate frame of X, Y, Z, you rotate with an angle phi to get what? Your final orientation. Good. Now, uh, I'll get back to this part when I talk about cap omega versus small omega. But uh, before that, I would like to talk about... Uh, Showing these angles in action, right? I have written a, a line of several lines of code of MATLAB, and I have made a cat part like this actually in SolidWorks. So I made this part and then um, I exported it as an STL file, which is very similar to these pictures that I got from the textbook by Bedford and Fowler. So I made a part like this, as you can see, and then I exported it as STL. And in one of my previous videos, if you watched it, I showed you how to animate the uh, STL files using um, MATLAB, right? If you go and look at the, um, I guess it's here under MATLAB, yes. Animating mesh files using MATLAB. So. You can read that uh, mesh file, that STL file, using the command STL read. Now here, this STL read that I'm using is not the STL read that is inside MATLAB and is added to MATLAB since 2020. This is the one that is shared on MathWork website. It's a little bit more complicated and uh, more useful than the one that you see added to the uh, MATLAB 
built-in functions. It's not as useful as this one. So, as I said, anyways, my goal here is I want to show you what happens when you apply any of these angles to that original part and then see the result of it. So, let's say here, here I read the STL file into MATLAB. I make it upright because when you bring it in, the way MATLAB brings it in, it is actually laid down horizontal. So I first, and it is not centered at point zero, zero, zero. So here I'm centering it. I am rotating it, making it upright. And then, and I show the original um, uh, was using a red color. Then here I have my three Euler angles. Right, for example, let me just show you the mutation, which is the most visible one. So let's say the initial and the final angle psi and phi are zero, but the mutation, which tells the object, make it at pi over two. I transfer my points to the new uh, frame and I show the new part in green. And here is what you can see. As I said, the red is the original was, while the green is the rotated one. So let me rotate it so you can see it. Okay, and you clearly see it has rotated about this x-axis, which is a line like this. And it has rotated for uh, pi over 2, as you can see. Right? So uh, you clearly see this is just one of them. Now, if I add uh, the original angle too, so let's say first spin it by pi over three and then rotate it for pi over two, uh, then you might not see a huge difference from here to the previous case. And the reason is this part that I made here is axisymmetric. Okay, so when it spins about itself, which is the first angle and actually the last angle, it does not show much of itself, okay? So you're not going to see too much, especially because I have centered the part at origin. I have centered the part at origin like kind of this case. If your part is not centered at origin, each one of those angles makes a huge difference, okay? So I can show you, for example, here, let me show you something. If I don't do this uh, centering, right? Let me just um, not center it. So now you see differences. Why? Because now your uh, original z-axis does not pass through the center of the part. So the psi angle will displace it about the z-axis, and when you do mutation, now you get something quite different. Okay, right? Let me make theta zero so that you can see only the effect of precision. You see? It looks like it's displaced, but it's not. And the reason is, as I said, the uh, center of the part, which is x of zero and y of zero, if you look, the line is here, which is outside the center of the red part. And the same thing for y, right? The y of 0 is here on the right. So what you're doing is, really, you are rotating this um, red part about an axis that is outside, like here. And when you rotate it with pi over 3, you get this guy. Okay, so it's not going to be just like this. So it depends on where you're putting it. The way that I set it was the three axes, uh, one of them was the axis of symmetry, the two other would intersect at it somewhere in the middle, but right now that's not the case, okay? That's why I did this um, bringing everything to the center to uh, make it... Uh, closer to those pictures. But as I said, right now, if you see here, I have rotated it with pi over 3 about the z-axis, which is now passing through the center. And as you can see, they are on the top of each other. There is no meaningful change. You clearly see that something is rotated, but uh, you probably don't see too much. Okay, so uh, 
the fact that the effect of each one of these angles is how much on the part depend on where the center is. Okay, so now how did I do that? Let me explain it a little bit for you. So the way that I did this animation here or this uh, simple plot here is using the idea of a rotation matrix. Okay, what is a rotation matrix? Again, I'm going to make a video and explain the rotation matrices in detail. But uh, what a rotation matrix is, is roughly if I have an initial frame and I have a final frame, correct? So let's say this is my initial frame and then this is my final frame. And you call this one, let's say, um, X0, Y0, and Z0. And this one you might call um, X1, Y1, and Z1. One okay, so the first frame has gone through some rotations, and now you ended up with the last frame or the second next frame, whatever you want to call it. Maybe there are several intermediates in between. Now, what the rotation matrix does, which you uh, it is as I said, it's a three by three matrix. So, what it does is it shows the orientation of one of these frames with respect to another one. For example, you might show the orientation of frame one with respect to frame zero. So, you show it like this one, the uh, new frame goes to the uh, subscript, the old frame goes to the superscript. Now, different textbooks have different notations. Some of them bring both of them to the right, both of them to the left, and so on. It's not really as important. It's just a matter of it's a relative thing. So what this one does, it shows the orientation of each one of these axes, x1, y1, or z1, with respect to what? The old frame. So what you have really is it shows uh, x1, or if you call the unit vector along x1, if you call it i1, it shows i1 dot i, zero. You know, this one is the cosine of angle between the x1 axis and the x axis. Then you do i1 dot j, zero, which is the angle between x1 and y0, and then i1 dot k, zero, which is the cosine of the angle between x1 and z0. So this column here completely tells me the orientation of what? The orientation of the x1 axis as it is written with respect to what? The axis of uh, frame 0. So as I said, this is i1, this is j1, and this guy is k1. And similarly here, I have j0, this is I naught, this is K naught. So the first column of that will tell you how uh, X1 axis is oriented with respect to frame zero. The second column of that will be like J1 dot I naught, J1 dot J naught, and j1 dot k naught so it specifies the orientation of y1 axis and similarly the last one is k1 that times uh, i naught k1 dot j naught and k1 dot k naught so you see it's it made of nine numbers it's a three by three matrix it has nine numbers and these nine numbers perfectly describe the orientation of each one of these axes with respect to the old frame and um, as i said you really need three rotations to go from here to here so nine numbers is a lot of redundancy but the understanding of it because the you know dot product means projection so you can easily project each one of these along those guys. This is easy to understand and digest. Now, one good thing about this rotation matrix is this. 
if I have a vector here, like vector uh, P, like this. So this is vector P. And then I have the exact same vector, the same orientation, the same magnitude, okay? In frame zero, then you know, because the orientation of these frames are different, the same vector will be presented differently with different components on each one of these frames, correct? So it's the same vector, but since the observer, the frame that you are decomposing everything along to are different, the components will be different. Now, this rotation matrix relates how P which is written along x naught y naught z naught is related to it relates to how it is written along what z1 x1 and y1 so it says if you know the coordinate of this vector uh, the components of p or the coordinate of point p in frame one if you multiply that by rotation matrix of frame one with respect to frame zero that gives you the coordinate of the same vector but as if it is written along what the axis of frame zero okay so you can easily show that and this is the most important property of the rotation matrix transferring coordinates from one frame to what to another frame so here as you can see the new frame if you multiply it from the left side or pre multiplied by r matrix it takes you back to what? The old frame. Many times this old frame is known. You want to find what? If I rotate it this much and that much, what's going to be the coordinate in the new frame? So from here, clearly, if you want the coordinate in the new frame, it has to be what? You have to multiply both sides by R inverse. So this is going to be R1 with respect to 0 inverse times p0 correct you pre-multiply both sides by inverse of r and uh, on this side you're going to get this one on this side r inverse times r is going to be identity matrix times p is going to be p now this r matrix is not just a regular matrix it is a special type of matrix again in the future video i talk a lot more about this guy but this R matrix is what we call orthonormal. And if you know um, from linear algebra, an orthonormal matrix is the one that the magnitude of each column is one, and each column is perpendicular to the other columns. And for these rotational matrices that they are all orthonormal, you can show that they're inverse is the same as their transpose, which makes life very easy. So here, instead of applying the inverse of R to P, I can say what? I'm going to apply the transpose of this rotation matrix times P. And this is exactly what I have used in this MATLAB code. So here I have obtained the rotation matrix and then I have applied the transpose of that to the coordinates in the old frame to get the coordinates in the new frame. Was under score V is the coordinate of the vertices of that STL file in the new frame. Was without underscore is the old frame. Now why did I here use also a transpose? Just, just because of the dimension of it was which has lots of rows and only three columns here i did it so that i can do the product here but you clearly see i used r transpose and multiplied okay and um i got that that's good so um so that's the idea of a rotation matrix right it's describing orientation or coordinates relation between the two frames but now you might say well what does it have to do with these Euler angles well you can show that depending on which axis you are rotating your uh, 
frame with respect to, you have a corresponding rotation matrix. So for example, it is not hard to show that if my original frame is like this. So this is X naught, this is Y naught, and this is Z naught. And if I rotate it about the Z axis, so this becomes X1, this becomes Y1, and Z1 is the same as what? Z naught. So all I'm doing is a rotation about the Z axis with angle theta. Then you can show that the rotation matrix here of frame 1 with respect to 0, which we also call it rotation of Z with angle theta, is of this form. It's not so hard to show. And again, in that future video, I am going to prove this. So it is going to be of a form cosine of theta, negative sine of theta, and 0, and then sine of theta, cosine of theta, 0, 0, 0, 1. Okay, so this is a rotation with angle theta about the z-axis. And then you can similarly show that if you rotate about the x-axis with angle theta, so x is not going to change, y and z are going to rotate, then it is going to be of a form like this. And finally, if you have a rotation about the y-axis with the angle theta, then it is going to be like this. Okay, so it's not hard to show. We call them the primary rotation matrices. Okay, it's not hard to show them. And that's what you see here I have used in uh, these rotation matrices. So the first one is a rotation about the z-axis. That's why you see it has the form of the z-axis. The angle of it is called psi, as you remember. So my first rotation matrix is rotation about Z with angle Psi, and that's the corresponding rotation matrix for it, R1. The next one is a rotation about X with angle Theta. The next one is a rotation about Phi with uh, about the Z axis. So that's R3. Now, by the way here, you see instead of Theta, I have a negative Theta. You might be a little bit confused at what, what is that that I'm doing. Why should I change this from theta to negative theta? The only reason I did it is because the part where that is imported into a MATLAB is up, imported upside down. So I had to uh, invert the sine of theta to make it upright and do the uh, appropriate um, rotation. If I don't do it, then when I ask it to rotate, let's say, theta 45 degrees, it rotates negative 45 degrees. So that's why I negated it here. But uh, it doesn't mean that I'm not using that formula. I am. Again, it's because of the way MATLAB imported the STL file from SOLIDWORKS. But um, everything else is uh, okay. And now the thing is this. If you have several of these rotations happening right after each other, just like this case, right? In Euler angles, we have a rotation of uh, angle uh, psi about the z-axis followed by x theta followed by z phi. How would you combine all of this into one single rotation matrix that you can use in this formula? Because that's what I ultimately want to do, right? I brought my STL files. The STL files have what? Have a bunch of points in them right? A bunch of corner points. And they all have their coordinate in the original frame I brought it into. So I have this guy from the STL file. Then 
this rotation that goes from frame 0 to frame 1. So here 0 means the cap XYZ that I had. And frame 1 means the final frame. Which is the small XYZ rotated by angle phi about the Z axis. Okay, so how do I get this? Because this is the result of all three rotations, psi, theta, and phi. How do I get it? Let's talk about that. So that's the next topic. Again, you have to go to that video for more info, but it is called composition of rotations. And you can show that if the rotation is always happening with respect to the current axis or the rotations is what I called intrinsic rotations. All the angles are with respect to the current X, Y, or Z, not the absolute X, Y, or Z. Then if you do a rotation by a rotation matrix R1, followed by a rotation matrix R2, followed by a rotation matrix R3, right? So this is my uh, initial part. And uh, I rotate it several different ways and finally maybe I end up with something like this. So here is something intermediate. I'm not going to draw it. Here is something intermediate, okay? So can I directly go from the first one to the last one by one single rotation? Yes, as long as that rotation is what? R1 times R2 times R3. As long as it's the product of them from the first one all the way to the last one, we call it pre-multiplication then yes, you can combine all of them into one rotation matrix. So here, as I said, the angles or the rotations are intrinsic, which means the rotations are done about current axis, not absolute, then the way to combine them is by pre-multiplication, okay? So this thing here we call pre-multiplication. So, and that's what, again, as I said, I have done here in the code. You see I have multiplied all three of them, the rotation of uh, Z with angle Psi, followed by rotation about x by angle theta, followed by another z with angle phi. I'll multiply them, and then I use the transpose of that, as I said, right? I use the transpose of that, which is this guy, multiply them together to get my what? Coordinates of the points as written in the new frame and then I plotted those with color green against the original one and you can see that. So as I said the part here is axisymmetric so rotation about the z which is upright is not going to give you much. The rotation about the current x-axis of course it does. So here that's what you get. Okay. And then you can have another rotation here, but again, as I said, it's not going to show too much of itself unless the part that you make is not symmetric. When the part is not symmetric, then you see clear differences. Okay, and uh, it's not super hard to show that, so let me show you that very fast. Of course, you all know SolidWorks, but... Let's say here I come and uh, mess up a little bit with this part and uh, reinsert it, reimport it into MATLAB. 
correct and uh, then maybe you can see something so let's say here I go ahead and um, I go on this front plane maybe and create a circular hole here like that right and then maybe i go on this right plane also and maybe i make another type of hole in it or maybe i add something to it but uh yeah let me just make it a cut as well so here okay so i made it quite different in shape and i save it and now i go save as and i save it as stl just make sure in solidworks when you export it you do not use tons of uh, corners reduce the uh, resolution of the stl file to coarse resolution so that uh, you, your matlab does not have to handle tons of you already saw the mesh although it was um, course it still had lots of data points and you can see that here that the number of corners data points that MATLAB has to rotate and replot them is about 10,000 data points okay so it has to apply this multiplication on 10,000 data points find the new locations and then uses the patch command to put them together so now I changed my STL file made it a little bit uh, not symmetrical let's see so now let me just do one of the angles so that you can see it better okay hopefully it shows especially if you make it transparent it is way better but now even if you look you see here the circular hole was here on the red part now on the green part it's not here anymore because it has been rotated about the x-axis the um, uh, z-axis so for this it is gone somewhere like here and that um, other part also is gone somewhere else and now as I said if you make it transparent which is using the alpha value the alpha value it makes it a little bit uh, nicer so as I said all you need is to go here and um, you can go to the patch command and look at the syntax of it. It should have the alpha value, the face color, edge color, C data, transparency. There we go, face alpha. Okay, so if you change the face alpha in anywhere between 0 to 1, 1 means completely opaque, 0 means completely transparent. So make it like 0 0.3, 0 0.2 or something like that. That means um, make it transparent. So let's go ahead and do that. So here um, I go ahead and say face alpha and then make it like 0.3. Then I do the same thing for the other one. Now let's see. There we go. Okay, so now you clearly see the location of the holes that are displaced, right? If you see here, you can see that the rectangular hole is rotated about the z-axis as well as what? The circular hole, okay? So you clearly see the uh, amount of uh, rotation here. So now it is meaningful. And now I go ahead and rotate this for pi over 4. So I do apply the mutation angle now. And now clearly they are going to be different because now you have the lateral tilting, the mutation. And um, you clearly see that as well here. All right. So you see now the location of the holes are completely different. And 
then you can add one more rotation. Now this rotation makes a difference. This is the spin rotation, which further shifts the location of the holes from what they had previously. Okay, so you clearly see that now uh, the locations are further changed. And this is the result of all three of them together. Okay, so uh, hopefully so far this uh, MATLAB code was a little bit clarifying for you on the meaning of these uh, Euler angles and uh, that we have different types of them that uh, how we use them to change the orientation of the part so really what we can do is visually yes we rotate them but in MATLAB or somewhere if you want to show them animate them you need to find the corresponding what rotation matrix for them which I have also shown for you here the first one is rotation z angle side. The second one is rotation with angle theta about x. And the next one is rotation with angle phi about z. Once you find these rotation matrices, you multiply them together. That's the overall rotation matrix. And then the new coordinate of the points is transpose of this guy times the old one, which you directly read from the STL file. Okay, so clearly you can use these three angles to change the orientation of the part from any initial to any desired final, okay? Here, to make it even more visible, I have shifted up this circular, this rectangular cut and brought it up so that it is cutting the top part of it, made it a little bit thinner. This shows the uh, effect of these angles quite better, right? So let me show you that. And let me bring down a little bit further the um, or increase the transparency so here as you can see this is only the precision angle and um, you clearly see that the location of the cut is rotated right only about the z-axis now I go ahead and apply some angle here like pi maybe over 2 and now you see it is going to be tilted down. Now the mutation angle is into effect. You clearly see that I have the initial rotation plus the mutation. And now I go ahead and add some um, spin as well but what I want to do is this let me um, have this and I would like to take a picture of this guy then I'll put it side by side with the one that Okay, so this is this one. The previous one was like this. And finally, I apply the spin angle. So here is the original one. There we go. Then we have this guy. Then we have this one. Okay, so hopefully now we can see the differences, right? 
this is only the angle um, psi then we add mutation and then we add what then we add the spin okay and this is kind of like that actually it's a little bit rotated it's like that but um, the location of the hole if you see instead of being here on the top it is now moved here okay so math lab will decide the angles for you if you don't specify them using the command view which in this case that's interesting i did it but i guess the second times when it did the patch it uh changed it a little bit yes so yeah this side's a little bit still automatic but you clearly see the differences again this one has to be rotated to be like that so the this direction of it is not going to change but this guy is going to spin about its axis okay so that is about the position okay that's position using Euler angles but that's not all of kinematics we also need to talk about what talk about the um, angular velocities right and uh, what I need to do here is I want to combine this portion of it with the kinetics okay and uh, when we drive the equations of motion the kinetics equation with Euler angles here I would like to divide the discussion for two different types of objects first the easier objects the objects that are axisymmetric like this so they have an axis of symmetry in this case we assume that that axis is z-axis and that means those products moments of inertia are zero and also the i the moments of inertia about the two other axes which is x and y they are the same value, okay, which you can clearly see for the sake of this axisymmetric object. For these uh, objects, uh, the way that we calculate the equations of motion and the uh, shape of the equations of motion is less intimidating compared to the cases where the object does not have any axis of symmetry and for which the equations of motion are quite a little bit uh, more complicated and a little bit maybe more intimidating. But uh, in general, the idea of both of them is to follow what we had in that 3D kinetics video. As I said, if you go to that video on uh, 3D kinetics that I published in my um, dynamics, playlist here 3d kinetics you see that at the end of it i showed you the euler equations and i showed them into the matrix format so let me show you the idea is basically to use the euler equations which you can see here to use these euler equations for any application and as I said here, we divide the discussion into two parts, object with axis of symmetry and without. Now, for objects with axis of symmetry we just mentioned, life is a little bit easier. First of all, because your um, um, inertia matrix, which in general looks like this, correct? It has nine elements. Now it is going to be as nice as this one, correct? Because the products are all zero and i y y and i x x are equal so your product moment is going to be extremely simpler also uh, if you remember in that uh, Euler equations we had uh, two omegas small omega and cap omega so if you haven't watched that video please go ahead and watch that video then come here because this is like continuing those but using a different set of angles so the cap omega and the small omega are different what are these these small omegas are the angular velocity components of the rigid body with respect to what 
with respect to the inertial frame. While cap omegas are the angular velocities of the secondary frame, the sensor frame, the frame with respect to which we observe and we measure the motion of the um, rigid body and that's the frame that here in our uh, previous pictures we call it frame XYZ small. So the frame XYZ small is my secondary or uh, observing frame. It does move but it is not perfectly in this first case attached to the rigid body. It does not have the last rotation. It does not have the spin angle. And it doesn't need to. Why? Because if I look with respect to this secondary frame, as I said, that um, does not have the spin, the spin does not matter in the values of these three numbers. Ixx, Ixx, which is the same as Ixy and Izz. So actually two values. The rest of the products are zero. These two are not going to change if I spin the xyz axis. Okay, so if um, I had the spin still, because this guy is axis symmetric, izz and ixx or iyy, they are not going to change. Okay, because all you do, you are spinning about the z axis, the small z axis. So the z axis is not going to change and x and y are going to rotate, but it doesn't matter their orientation because this object is axisymmetric. So what we do, as I said, is cap omegas are measuring what? Measuring the um, angular velocity of this frame, small x, y, z with respect to the cap x, y, z. The small omegas are the angular velocities of the rigid body, which also includes the angular velocity phi dot with respect to the inertial. But everything, small xyz, cap xyz, the moments of inertia, everything that you have in this um, Euler equations, and even the moments mx, my, mz, Everything is decomposed, it is written, it is expanded along the secondary frame, along the small xyz. Okay, so just keep in mind, everything here is written along small xyz. And what's the importance of all this? Let me explain that because it is actually very important that how you select your secondary frame and whether there are entities that have time derivatives and so on and so forth. So um, if you remember, in general, the equations governing the rotation are what? They say that sum of the moments about point O or centroid, one of them, if O is the origin or a fixed point, is equal to time rate of change of the angular momentum about that point, correct? That's the definition, that's, the, sorry, the original format of the moment, angular momentum equation which governs the rotation. Now this HO here, I have shown you in one of my previous videos, look at that, the three important proofs of, of rigid body kinematics, is this HO can be written as matrix I about O times what? Times omega. And that I is the same thing that I had, correct? This one was negative Ix. Um, this one was Ixx. I, uh, I, Y, Y, I, Z, Z. And then the product terms, they were all negative, correct?
So this guy, if you call it um, inertia matrix I, then I have HO to be what? IO times omega. Good. So now when I here take a derivative, what happens? I have the product of two terms, IO and what? Omega. And the matter of fact is this omega vector, depending on you write it about which axis, then the component of that can change with respect to time as well as the orientation. So what I did here, I wrote all of these moments about the x, y, z small frame. So when you write the moments along the x, y, z, because this is a general equation. This general equation can be written along any axis that you want. It's like f equal ma, correct? Remember I told you that you can write this equation along what? Along any coordinate frame that you want. You can write it along small x, y, z. You can write it along cap x, y, z. You can write it along r theta z, which is the cylindrical coordinate, so on and so forth. So as long as the rule is valid, you can write it along any frame that you want. Now, what I want here is to write this uh, rule that I have here, this equation. I want to write everything along the small x, y, z. So this I, O has to be written in the small x, y, z, and omega has to be written along the small x, y, z. Good? Now, what does it mean when you write omega about small x, y, z? When you write i about x, y, z, it means all of these moments are calculated with respect to the small x, y, z frames. Okay, that's the meaning of that. But when you say omega is written in uh, x, y, z, it means what? It means omega can be written as the component of it, omega x, i plus omega y, j plus omega z, k. Agreed? where omega x, y, z are the components of omega written along x, y, z axis, and i, j, k are what? They are the unit vectors. They are the unit vectors along this small x, small y, and small z. So these are like this. These are not the inertial x, uh, i, j, k. These are what? These are the i, j, k that rotate, because they are attached, they are for the frame that is rotating. It has motions of psi and theta. So, what now? So, here, when you take time derivative of this, you know, based on what you learn in calculus, the derivative of a product is what? It's the derivative of the first one, times the second one, plus first one, times the derivative of the second one. Now, the derivative of the second one, d omega over dt, comes from what? As you know, when you are taking derivative of this guy, again here you have product terms. Omega xi, omega yj, omega zk, and... When you take derivative of this, since these omega x, y, z, their magnitude can change, and since i, j, k, they can rotate, so it means they have time derivative, your time derivative of small omega is going to be what? It is going to be d omega x over d t i plus d omega y over dtj plus d omega z over dtk. This is because of the component magnitude change. And then plus um, omega x times di over dt and omega y dj over dt and then omega z dk over dt. Now, what's the derivative of this ijk? Since ijk are 
uh, from frame XYZ. And frame XYZ is rotating about the inertial frame with angular velocity cap omega based on what you know from my previous videos and what you know from uh, probably calculus 3. This guy is going to be omega cross i. This guy is going to be omega cross j. And this guy is going to be omega cross k. So if you keep this as is, this whole thing can be written as omega cross. If you plug the components there, it is going to be times omega. Okay. So if you plug everything up here, it is going to be d i o x y z small over d t omega and then plus what i o times a vector which is d omega over d t or uh, maybe you should not write it that way you should write it like this and then plus omega times i o times omega and this is omega cross that actually where here are d omega x over dt, d omega y over dt, and d omega z over dt. Okay? So, I know it's getting complicated, but bear up with me. So, these two terms that you see here and here are exactly what you see in the Euler equations look that's the first one and the next one is this now you might say where is the cross gone here go back please to that video on 3d kinetics you see that instead of me this is i omega instead of me uh, cross multiplying the vector of omega x omega y omega z cap omega x y z by this guy i can instead form a matrix, we call it this Q-symmetric matrix of omega, which is this guy that you see, and then multiplied by IO times omega. So this way, instead of doing a cross product, I do everything through my matrix multiplication. Okay, so please go back and watch that video where I explained where this cross is converted into this, and where does this matrix we call the Q-symmetric matrix of omega came from. But you clearly see I have both of these terms in here, right? And now you might say to yourself, well, where, where did that third term, this first one in this equation go? What about this? Well, we have to choose our secondary frame such that if we want to use those equations, if we want to use these equations, we have to choose our frame small x, y, z, our secondary frame, our sensing frame, our, our, our observing frame. We have to choose it such that this term is zero. This term vanishes. And when does that vanish? When rotation of the rigid body with respect to this secondary frame does not change the i values okay when the rotation of the rigid body again I, I say it one more time when the rotation of the rigid body with respect to the secondary frame does not cause the i values to change then yes this di over dt will be zero now when is it that this can happen well, as I said, if your object does have an axis of symmetry like this case. In this case, 
if you look at the last picture, my second reframe XYZ is not completely body attached. The rigid body does have a motion of phi, a spin of phi with respect to it. But since the object is axisymmetric, the rotation of the rigid body with angle phi with respect to a small XYZ frame is not going to change any of the i numbers. First of all, because the products are always zero, ix is equal to iy, iz, the z axis is not going to change due to spin. So none of the i values is going to change. Therefore, yes, I can say this time derivative of i is going to be what? Zero. And so that's how I choose my secondary frame. Not perfectly attached to rigid body, just allowing the rotation phi to happen with respect to it. Okay, so that's how I define it. Now, in case we have an object without axis of symmetry, in this case, when I do rotation of this in the last stage, the shape is not symmetric anymore. Okay, so the shape is something like this, whatever it is. Now, if my axes are just spinning, nothing else, right? So this X from here comes here, and the Y goes there. Now, the product terms and everything else will change, even the original IXX and IYY. Maybe the Z doesn't change due to spin, but everything else does change. So in case that I have an object, object without axis of symmetry, I cannot choose my secondary frame to uh, be like this case, where uh, it has all the motions of the rigid body except for the spin. The only solution is to make what? To make my secondary frame completely body attached. So when the object is not axisymmetric, I have to make my secondary frame body attached. In other words, cap omega is the same as what? Small omega. In this case, this small xyz is always attached to the rigid body, even when it does the spin. So the configuration of the object with respect to small xyz will never change as well. It means the i values are going to stay constant. So in order to force this derivative to be zero, in order to force this derivative to be zero in case of no axis of symmetry, this time I have to make my secondary frame body attached. In this case, I did not. I let the spin to be not a part of the secondary frame. In this case, I had to. Now you might say, what's the big deal? Why didn't you make, in this case also, your secondary frame to be body attached. Well, I'll show you the difference comes from these omega values. When you make it body attached or when you don't make it body attached, the values for these small and cap omega components are gonna be quite different. If you look here, the components of cap and small omega are quite simple, while in this case, the components of them are having more terms, they show more terms, and that's what makes my uh, governing equations in general quite more involved with more terms in them compared to a case like this. Okay, but that's the only way to go about it. There is no other way to get around it. Good. So uh, first, let's go back to the axisymmetric and talk about the axisymmetric. Then we come back to this... Uh, no symmetry. So where did I get this small and cap omegas? Because once I have those, I know my I matrix. Remember, we know our I matrix would be like this. Once I know my small omega and cap omega, I can take also their time derivative, and then I will get my governing rotational equations. So the only thing is, what is a small, what is cap omega? Where, how do I get them? And remember, both of these small and cap omegas have to be written along the small xyz frame. So what do I do? So here I 
rotate my um, original frame with uh, rotational velocity psi dot with angle psi and get to the intermediate frame as you remember then I rotate my intermediate frame about the X prime axis with angle theta with angular velocity theta dot and I get to my what to my secondary frame XYZ so now clearly my secondary frame XYZ is not going to see phi dot because uh, it never had that phi dot later happens from the rigid body with respect to this guy so this guy is out of the picture phi dot all it can see is psi dot and what theta dot now how do you project those two guys on this um, secondary frame so let's take a look the theta dot is rather clear why because theta dot is about the intermediate frame x prime which is also the same as x so all you have for theta dot is align the x-axis and that's what you see here okay it's only along the x-axis so it goes to the first component what psi dot is along the original z cap z or along the z prime intermediate z prime but when you rotate it about x prime, now z prime is gone to z and y prime is gone to y, both rotated by angle what? By angle theta. So that psi dot that you had around the original z prime should now be decomposed along the new y and the new z. And clearly you can see that if you decompose it with angle theta, the sine component goes along y, the cosine component will go along z. So psi dot times sine theta and then psi dot times cosine theta are the terms for omega y and omega z, correct? So this case is quite clear. Where are the angular velocities of the secondary frame coming from? Now, what's the difference between that and the omegas of the rigid body? Again, remember, these guys are for the secondary frame. These guys are for the rigid body. Rigid body has everything like the secondary frame, except at the end, you are now also rotating it about the z-axis with angle what? Phi dot. So it's exactly like cap omega except in the z direction you added a what a phi dot which is completely obvious so you clearly see where cap omega and small omegas are coming from it's a simple uh, projection now that i have those small omegas cap omegas and my equivalent i matrix for the axisymmetric object i plug in everything here so this is my i. This is the time derivative of the small omega components. As you see the omega x, omega y, omega z. I plug them here, here, here. This is my skew symmetric matrix of cap omega. As you can see here, the omega um, z, omega y, and omega x are shown here as well here. This is the i, and this is again the small omega correct so this is your omega this is your i this is your skew symmetric matrix of cap omega this is your d omega over dt's correct d omega x over dt d omega y over dt d omega z over dt And again, this is I. So you will get this formula, correct? It's this term and this term. And again, because the spinning does not change I's, this term is zero. So we only calculate these first two terms. And you see, I have them over here. You carry out the time derivatives here using the chain rule. Multiply everything and you get your final equations for mx my and mz based on the three angles their time derivatives and the i values okay so these are the governing 
Euler equations for rotation if I use Euler angles. These are for rotations, and as you know, for translation, I still have my sum fx equal to mx double dot and sum fy equal m y double dot and sum fz equals what? Um, mz double dot, correct? So where small x, small y, and small z are, again, the secondary frame axis. So these three are governing my translations. These three are governing my what? My rotations. And these will, together will give you all the motions of the rigid body. Again, all I did here, this part you don't change. You don't need to change because you are still using X, Y, Z. The only thing you are changing is what? It is the format of the rotation equations based on which one of these different ways that I mentioned you choose to represent the rotation. Here I chose these guys for rotation. In this video that I mentioned here, in these videos, these omega x, omega y, omega z, they are what? That omega x is d of theta x over d theta d. Omega y was d theta y over dt. And omega z was d theta z over dt. Where these theta values are absolute values of the frame attached to the rigid body measured from the absolute or inertial frame. Okay, they are not intermediate angles, they are absolute angles. They are not intrinsic, they are extrinsic. And so the form of the equations are going to be a little bit different. But here with the Euler angles, you clearly see that I get this form. And now with all that in mind, let's first look at one application, right? Because, yeah, it takes a ton of time for us to derive everything. But now let's look at one application of this. So one application here is a uh, basically top, correct? The spinning top. And here I am spinning this top with um, an angular velocity of phi dot, the spinning velocity. And here for the moment being, um, what I will do, I can assume that it is pinned down here to the origin. It's not really, but here let's assume for the moment that this guy is pinned down here. And not pinned down, it's like a spherical joint, really. Because pin takes five degrees of freedom away. So what you have here is basically a spherical joint. So this one cannot move, but it can have all the three angles. Or it can have all the three rotations. So my uh, translation equations, sum fx, sum fy, sum fz equations, will be zero equals zero. They are not going to give you anything. All that matters is rotations. And instead of me using theta x, theta y, theta z, the absolute, I'm going to use phi, theta, and psi. The precision, the mutation, and the spin. And I want to look at the specific type of motion, which we call steady precision of a spinning type. So what does that mean? It means you spin this... Uh, uh, top and this phi dot which is the angular velocity of the spin you make sure this guy is constant okay so you apply a high rpm and assuming that you don't have too much of friction down here because you always do and as a result of that phi dot starts to change but here, assume that there is no friction here, no air drag, no nothing. So you can keep phi dot to be constant. And uh, as a result of that also, again, if there is no friction, then what you will see is due to the weight of 
uh, the top, if it's not in the beginning perfectly vertical, it starts to tilt and go to this angle, nutation angle theta. And this nutation angle theta, if this phi dot, you can keep it constant, which again is a very hard thing because there is friction here. You can keep it very high and constant. Then you can see that this guy will be tilted, but it is going to be tilted at what? At a constant angle theta. So your theta is not going to change. In other words, theta dot is going to be zero. And if that happens, so you are going to get this guy tilted and it is spinning and not only it spins and it's tilted, it starts to now go around the Z axis. So it is going to go around the Z axis while it is spinning around itself. It also goes around the Z axis, which creates what? Psi dot. And you can show that psi dot also, again, if there is no friction, that psi dot, the RPM of this guy going around the Z axis would also be constant. That kind of motion we call steady precision, which also means, of course, steady, not only precision, this is the steady precision. It also means the constant speed and then constant mutation angle. Constant speed angle, constant uh, precision ang uh, angular velocity, and constant mutation angle. If all of that happens, then many of the terms in this top equation are going to go away. Like what? Since theta is constant, any time derivative of that is zero, which means this term is going to go, this term is going to go, uh, this term is going to go, then this term is going, this term is going, right? Psi double dot is zero because psi dot is constant. So this term is going, this term is going. Since phi dot is also constant, phi double dot is zero. So it means m z and m y are going to be equal to zero because all of the terms are zero. From the top one, something remains, and that is, as you can see, i z z phi dot psi dot sine theta. Is this guy. And then this term, which is i z z minus i x x i dot squared sine theta cosine theta, and that is equal to moment about x. And how much is moment here about the x axis, the intermediate x axis? Well, as you can see here, this is your x axis. This guy. This is the only force with respect to point O that creates a moment, correct? Because you know the reactions of that spherical joint passing through point O, so they have no moment. The only force that creates moment about O is mg. The distance of it from mg is h, so the moment is going to be mg times h. And if you look at the direction of it, it is going to be what? Since this mg is on the left side of x-axis, so it is going to be counterclockwise. So it's positive mg h. And the thing is, uh, you also have the angle theta, which is the tilted angle. Okay, because this is your h. And that is your mg, and there is angle theta between them, so you have to multiply by sine of theta. So mg sine theta h, which is the moment of the gravity, the force of gravity, the weight, with respect to the x-axis, that is equal to this guy here. And this one, so, will be your governing equation on the steady precision. And you might say, okay, what's the importance of that? What does that give me at all? Well, if you look at that here, for a spinning top, I, Z, I, X are fixed numbers. M, G is fixed number. H depends on the geometry of the top. It's a fixed number. Uh, if you... Determine phi dot. It depends on how fast you are spinning it. Because this phi dot you would set, you would determine. Okay, so this is fixed, this is fixed. Uh, this is fixed, this is fixed. MGH is fixed. 
If you see here, everything is fixed in this equation except for what? Except for theta and psi dot. Okay, so this guy you are going to set. And now, what's the good thing about this equation? Well, this equation gives you the relation between these two parameters, theta and what? Psi dot. So, for example, if I can measure my psi dot, I can determine theta. Or if I can measure my theta, then I can determine what? Psi dot, the precision rate. Correct? So, this one equation gives you the relation between what? The precision rate and the angle theta. In real life, you can never get this perfectly because of friction here in this uh, spherical joint. You will have other moments, and those other moments will make your theta to start gradually increase and your phi dot to decrease, which as a result will affect the psi dot as well. So achieving that is close to impossible because you have to have no friction here and you have to have a mechanism to keep this phi dot constant. Okay, but in that theoretical case of steady precision of a top, you can determine the tilt angle, the mutation angle, if you know the spin RPM and the precision RPM. Okay, and one physical example of that, let me show you that since it might be interesting, is these, uh, when you see Mr. Walter Levin, he shows the gyroscopic effect in one of his lectures. That would be a good case of this, so let me show you that. So what he does here is he hangs a bicycle tire will from um, the end point of this uh, axle he hangs it from this point to a cable that is vertical and you know if you don't spin this wheel what happens well, and if I... what you have is you have your cable that is hanging from the ceiling and if you bring this wheel like this which is mounted on this axle or axis whatever you want to call it axle in this case if you just hang it from there what happens well because of the force of gravity here you will have a moment about this force and this moment which clearly you see it is going to be clockwise what happens is this will starts to what go down like that correct and it keeps going down right It is going to keep going down and then go this way. So it's not going to stay in one place. It is going to go down because of the uh, moment of the gravity of the wheel and because you have some arm here, right? Now what he does is, instead of that, that he just simply hang it, what he does, not only he hangs it, before hanging it from this point, he gives it a what? He gives it a big spin. Okay, he gives it a big spin, phi dot. So he makes this guy spin about that axis. Maybe you want to show it here. And then hang it from the cable. And now Although you expect here that because of the moment of this gravity, this guy should again go down and keep changing its angle, it doesn't. What you see is it is going to be tilted like this. So it is going to get its mutation angle. Okay. But this theta is going to stay almost constant. So instead of this just keep going down, it doesn't. It stays at some tilted angle theta, 
And not only that, now you'll see that this whole thing is going to go around the cable and it turns around the cable, which in this case, that's psi dot, the precision. Okay, and this is what you also might call gyroscopic effect, which is basically because of this spin, because of this spin, when it gets the mutation, then the axis of this guy tries to keep its orientation. And that's what you use in gyroscope to determine the orientation of rotating objects. So uh, let me show you what he does. So uh, I would give it a twist. So let's see what he does. So he puts it on this electric motor and you see he's giving it a huge spin, a big phi dot and then goes and then hangs it from that cable. And you see here that Axel has, <laughs> that's another interesting thing he does, but uh, let's see if he hangs it from, so here he's using it onto himself on a chair, but here, I guess it's right now. There we go. Here. You clearly see that uh, it is spinning. It is keeping its theta angle at a constant number. And it is also spinning about the cable, which is your precision. And all of that is because of the original spin of the wheel. Okay, so that is the gyroscopic effect. Very interesting. And um, that is to a good extent what uh, we have discussed here, right? So um, In the case of this example, and for the case of a gyro, if you can spin it very hard, because the way that the gyro is set on gimbals, you should be able to keep your theta at 90 degrees. So if this constant theta that you are keeping, if you can keep it at 90 degrees, which you can if you are mounting it on the gimbals, then what you have is your cosine of theta is going to be zero. By the way, here you might say, what are these C's and S's? Sorry, I did not uh, mention them earlier. So these are just short notations. Anytime you see S of theta, okay, it means sine of theta. And anytime you see C of theta, it means cosine of theta. And the same thing for phi and psi. Okay, so these are short notations for sine and cosine, so you don't have to type them all the time. I just use S and C. So if that's the case, it means C of theta is uh, 0 and S of theta is 1. So what happens to this equation? This becomes 1. This guy becomes all 0 because C of theta is 0. This guy becomes 1. And... Clearly, this MGH is the moment that you have, the, the uh, moment that wants to um, change the orientation of the object. So if you call this whole thing M or MX, which in this case is MGH, it is going to be equal to IZZ times phi dot times psi dot. And this is the formula that you see probably in many textbooks for uh, the gyroscopic effect. They say that um, if you want to know how fast that wheel is rotating about the cable, this psi dot, you can find it from this equation. It is going to be mx divided by iz phi dot. The bending moment divided by IZZ, which is the I of the wheel about its um, axis of symmetry, times phi dot, the original spin that you gave to the wheel. Okay, so this one you can calculate, this one you can calculate. In this case here, 
if this is mg and this distance from here to here is like d then this guy is going to be mgd okay and then from here you can clearly calculate your precision angular velocity again this is assuming that you can keep your theta here equal to constant of pi over 2 if you cannot uh, then this uh, first term is not going to be zero and finding side dot as a function of theta is a little bit more complicated it's now a quadratic equation okay because the side dot term is there it's going to be a quadratic equation and if you still call this m then you and the theta is constant so sine theta cosine theta are just constant numbers you clearly see you have to find your precision uh, speed through a quadratic equation not this simple linear equation okay so hopefully i could explain this motion of the gyroscopes and the motion of a top and using this equation now as i mentioned in case your rigid body does not have axis of symmetries okay then if you do not want that i dot term to appear remember here we discussed it that um see if i can find it Remember, I said, if you do not want this term to appear, this guy, which we don't have in the Euler equations, if you don't want this, you have to make sure the i does not change with respect to time, which means as the object rotates, the moments of inertia of it with respect to the secondary frame do not change. And when you don't have axis of symmetry, the only way it can happen is you force the secondary frame to be attached to the rigid body. Then, of course, it is always attached to the rigid body. It has all the three motions, phi, theta, psi. And the position of x, y, z axis with respect to rigid body is fixed. Therefore, they are not going to, the i components are not going to change. Now, so you can still use what? You can still use your... Uh, Euler equations, these guys here. You can still use these equations. Good? Now, to make life a little bit simpler, so here, this guys, instead of cap omega, are now going to be small omega, because cap omega and small omega are the same thing now. Good? Now, um, the problem is with these product terms which clearly if you look at this picture they are not zero none of the product terms is zero unless you do something to make your equations a little bit simpler because if you don't the result of these equations are going to be really big okay they are going to be quite horrible looking unless as i said you do something and the thing you do is although xyz small xyz is fixed with respect to the rigid body but the initial orientation of it which you want to keep fixed you choose such that this xyz axes are principal axes of your uh, rigid body you know any rigid body has always three principal axes regardless of its shape whether it has symmetry or not you can always find the principal axis and you know with respect to the principal axis all product moments are going to be what zero so i'm going to choose an orientation for this small xyz such that they are principal axis and so this way I make sure my i x y i x z and i y z the product terms are zero so that this matrix here gets all of these terms zero and it is a little bit giving me a nicer type of equation with fewer terms now when you don't have symmetry of course this time your i x x and i y y are clearly not going to be the same 
But again, if you choose them as principal x's, you can force these guys to now go to what? To zero. Good. So if we can find them, which we should be able to, any object that you have, let's say here, this is this, pro this, is this part that is not symmetric, right? If you go and, let's say here in this CAD software, go to evaluations and then go to mass properties, Okay, you see that you have principal axes of inertia and their moments. Okay, and as you can see, with respect to the principal moments of inertia, you only have IXX, IYY, and IZZ, while with respect to the original XYZ, which is not principal, you also have what? you also have the uh, product terms, okay? So uh, a good CAT software should be able to give you if the part is complicated. If the part is simple, it's not hard to find the principal axis, right? Based on what you know from statics. But if the part is complicated, then you can use a CAT software and the CAT software should be able to give you the orientation of or a rotation matrix for your uh, principal axis. So uh, let's say we did that. Those product terms are zero. Good. My secondary frame is attached to the rigid body. Amazing. So now in my uh, Euler equations, this is going to be my I matrix. Very good. What I need is now the skew symmetrics of cap omega, which is in this case skew symmetrics of small omega. This is your omega, and this is your uh, d omega x, d omega y, and d omega z over uh, d omega x, d omega y, and d omega z all over dt, the time derivatives. So... Uh, the only thing remaining is, of course, what is a small or cap omega, which are the same thing. How do I find it? And as I said, in this case, you need to go one further step in projection because now your uh, secondary axis would also go through angle phi. So first you start with psi dot. You go to the intermediate frame x prime, y prime, z prime. Then you rotate about x prime with theta dot. And you go to what? You go to another intermediate frame here, which is called double primes. X double prime, Y double prime, and Z double prime. And then about the Z double prime, which is the same as the final Z, you rotate with angle what? Phi and with angular velocity phi dot. So... Um, you will end up with your secondary and body attached frame x, y, z. So in this case, when you want to project psi dot, theta dot, and phi dot along the um, axis of x, y, z, you need a little bit more projection. Phi dot is no big deal. Phi dot is still around z, so that's what you see here. It is appearing as a single term. That's not a big deal. What about theta dot, the intermediate rotation? Theta dot, which was aligned the x double prime, now it has to be decomposed aligning what? Aligning the x and y. Why? Because it was aligning x double prime, and x double prime is different from x and y. Correct? So what you need is, or... Um, Yes, because you later rotated with angle phi and you made x uh, double prime to go to x. So because of that angle phi, your theta dot is now going to be projected. And you can see that projection here. Where is that? Let me show you. Sorry, theta dot, not phi dot. So your theta dot is going to be projected by angle phi. And you can see that here. This is your x prime along which the theta dot happened. It is rotated to x by angle phi, your y uh, double prime. 
is rotated to y again by angle phi. So this theta dot will be decomposed along new x and new y. The new x component, as you can clearly see, since this is phi, it is going to be theta dot cosine theta. And for your y component, it's going to be negative theta dot sine phi because it is opposite to the y-axis. And that's what you see here, negative theta sine phi, and then what? Theta dot cosine phi. These guys coming from theta dot. Okay, so these are the projections of theta dot align x, y, z. Phi dot is already aligned z, so that's not a big deal. Now we have to go to what? We have to go to the original rotation, psi dot, which goes through two rotations. So your psi dot was originally aligned z prime. When you do the rotation theta, when you do the rotation theta, you have to decompose it aligning the intermediate y double prime and z double prime, and you will get psi dot sine theta aligning y double prime, and psi dot cosine theta aligning what? z double prime, yes? Now, when you go from the double primes to what? These are the double primes. y double prime and z double prime. When you go from those to the new frame rotated by angle phi, what happens? Since the phi was about z or z double prime, you know, z and z double prime are the same thing. So this component of it, which was along z double prime, is not going to be affected by phi because phi is along this guy. So that psi dot cosine theta along z, which you can see here, it is going to stay. That is not affected by rotation phi because that's on the axis of rotation. But this component here, this guy, which was aligned y double prime, is now going to be what? Rotated into y, correct? So whatever the sine theta dot was here will now be decomposed aligning what? Aligning the new um, x and aligning the new y, which are these two guys. And clearly you see that when this is angle phi, this guy here is 90 degrees minus phi. So if you want to project that psi dot sine theta aligned x, you have to multiply it by cosine of 90 minus phi, which is sine phi. So you should have psi dot sine theta sine phi, which you have here. And then sine, uh, psi dot sine theta multiplied by sine of 90 minus phi, which is cosine phi, should be aligned y, which you can see here. Okay, so here your psi dot has to be projected twice, your theta dot is projected once, your phi dot doesn't. And that's what makes your uh, terms of small or cap omega a little bit more complicated to this case, where they were quite simpler if you remember, right? If you look here, your um, small and cap omegas were very much simpler than this case. So although we could get rid of those product terms, moment of inertia product terms, by choosing principal excess, still our omega terms have more stuff in them. And so when you do all these products and time derivatives, it makes your final governing equation to have what? A lot more terms in them. But that's all it is. That's all you can do. And... Uh, this is, in general, Euler equations with Euler angles for an object without axis of symmetry. Okay, so you can use these guys. And um, let me tell you one last thing. So if I have a specific situations like this, like this top, right? If I have a specific situations like this top, 
for this object without axis of symmetry, in general, the Euler equations that you would get for rotation, you cannot analytically solve. Okay? There is no way that you can analytically solve them. So even if I give you mx, my, and mz, even as constant numbers, forget that like in this case, one of them is a function of theta. Let's say these are just constant numbers. So this is like constant c1, this is like constant c2, this is like what? Constant c3. What's the goal here? When I say solve it, it means you give me back theta, or you give me back psi as a function of t, you give me back theta as a function of t, and you give me back what? Phi as a function of t. Can you give me the three angles as a function of time? The answer is no, you can't. Why? Because if you look at these governing equations, the first one that has theta double dot in it has the rest of the terms as well. This one that has psi double dot in it, again, has the rest of the terms. And this one that has phi double dot, it also has psi double dot. And these are completely nonlinear because sine and cosine of these angles and their uh, dots, terms, linear or square, all multiply together. So what you can see here are three coupled nonlinear second order ordinary differential equations. And because they are nonlinear we are, and they are coupled, solving them like this is almost impossible unless there are specific cases that everything is assumed to be constant and simple and so on. In most of the cases, the only way to get there is a numerical solution. Okay, you can always solve this numerically, but there is no way that you can do it analytically. Okay, so for example, let's say here, let me give you this important thing. Let's say if I want to solve the top problem, okay, the spinning top, and uh, these um, moments are not as simple. So, you know, in the case of this top, your mx is, of course, mgh sine theta, but your my and mz, in general, there is no reason for them to be zero, and the reason is you have friction here. And when you do have friction, it means you have a negative moment about z. And that is, uh, depending on the type of friction, it could or could not be proportional to this phi dot. So let's say here I have some lubrication, so the moment is proportional to phi dot in the negative direction, so it's like k times negative phi dot, that's moment z, let's say there is no moment y, so what you need to solve is basically something like this. This is... Um, m g h sine theta this is zero and this is like negative k times phi dot so i give you these three governing equations and then i ask you as i said for phi of t for theta of t and for psi of t i say what are these can you solve them for me if i give you some initial conditions right could you do that for me and yes you can as long as from these equations you can find your psi dot, you can find your uh, theta dot and uh, phi dot, double dot, in terms of everything else. And then um, you basically do a numerical calculation. Okay, so I am going to write a code right now and share it with you. So here I just wrote the code, and uh, as we have three second-order differential equations, we need uh, six dummy variables. As you know, 
since OD45 and other OD solvers in MATLAB, they are for first order ODs. So since you have second order things, then you need to consider six dummy variables, and this is how I chose them. So here I call them cap Z. This Z is different than the Z coordinate, of course. So Z number one, I um, chose it to be my psi z number two i chose it to be psi dot z number three i chose it to be theta z number four i chose it to be theta dot z number five was phi and z number six was phi dot so you need to choose these six variables in any order that you want this is how i did it and then using those, you can convert your three second order ODs into six first order ODEs, which uh, you can see here. These are my six um, first order ODs, which one, for example, says uh, the dot of first one is the second one. And of course it is, right? If you take time derivative of the first one, it is going to be the second one. If you do it for third one, it is going to be the fourth one if you do it on the fifth one it is going to be the sixth one however when you take derivative of the second one it is psi double dot the derivative of the fourth one is theta double dot and the derivative of the last one is phi double dot and these three are the ones i told you you have to find from your um, equations here Right, so you have to find theta double dot, phi double dot, and psi double dot. And what I did, I wrote this setup equation as a matrix times these three guys. Is equal to a known vector. And uh, here, this i call it matrix aa in my code this right hand side known vector call it bb and these are functions of the i's and the theta phi the dot, dot terms and everything as you can see all you need for example in this top equation to keep this term and everything else which does not have second derivative to take them all to uh, the left side the same thing here, this term would stay, this term, this one, and this one all go to here. Here, two terms will stay because they have double dot. This term would go to this side. And so you write your equation like this. And then the solution, if you call this unknown x, it is going to be the inverse of the coefficient matrix times the right-hand side uh, known vector, which is exactly what you see I have done here. So I have wrote my um, double dot terms into this linear set of systems, solve for it. And then the first element of that is uh, psi double dot. The second element is theta double dot. The third element is phi double dot. And the dots, the other dots, they are coming from like this is, this means uh, derivative of psi is psi dot. This means derivative of theta is theta dot. This means derivative of phi is phi dot so these are the six first order odes i have i also have here uh some numbers and i got them actually from my uh solidworks object that i made so i got the mass i got the height of the center of mass with respect to the bottom and i got the moments of inertia from here and i uh, incorporate them here into my code and then uh, that's my function that I use with OD45. Here I'm solving it for two seconds. I give it initial precision angle of zero, initial precision velocity of zero, initial uh, nutation angle of pi over two, just like that will that was uh, hung from the cable. Initial nutation um, speed of zero, initial... Um, spin angle of zero and initial spin rpm of 10,000 radians per second okay so i'm rotating 
my um, uh, spinning top at a very high RPM, okay? 10,000 radians per second, that's a big number. You want, I can even bring it down, making it like a thousand radians per second, which is a big RPM, you know? You have to um, basically multiply it by 60 divided by two pi, which is gonna be in this case about uh, 10,000 RPM. That's a huge RPM that you might not even be able to achieve. But uh, I'm running my simulation with that function I wrote including my ODEs for two seconds with those initial conditions. And then I'm going to plot for you your theta, your phi, and your psi versus time. So first here I do psi and theta. Maybe let me even I bring this a little bit further down. So here first you can see your uh, psi and theta. As you can see, your um, theta is almost constant which is what you expected, right? You did not expect your uh, theta to change if there was no friction at the pin, at the spherical joint. And that's what I did here. Um, you look, uh, I set my uh, viscous friction coefficient to zero. So here I assume there is no friction. And I reduced my RPM to smaller number. You see your theta is almost constant, which should be. And then your um, psi, which is the precision angle, which is the wheel spinning about the cable, the angle is increasing, which means it is uh, keep it is rotating. If you want, I can bring in also the um, uh, phi. Now the thing is, phi is increasing so fast because it is following this big number of phi dot. So when you put all three of them next to each other you will not really see psi as increasing too much because phi is increasing so fast. Okay, so phi is crazy increasing so fast. But your psi is also increasing, but here because of the scale, it's a little bit hard to see there is a slope on the blue line. Okay, but as I said, if you take this away, of course phi is increasing. And uh, get rid of phi... This plot is uh, quite revealing that not only you can keep the mutation angle almost constant, your precision is started and your wheel is rotating, or in this case, your tip top is, uh, your uh, spinning top, sorry, your spinning top is rotating about the uh, axis Z. Okay, now you see here, there are a little bit numerical instabilities because the RPM is not big, but if you make this big, you see those um, waves should uh, change a little bit. You see here, your theta is almost perfectly constant and your psi is increasing, so you see clearly the effect of the solution. Now, if I add a little bit friction at the spherical joint, right, so I make this number non-zero, and let's see what happens. So in this case, clearly you cannot keep theta constant, regardless of how fast your RPM is. Your theta is going to oscillate and go up and down because there is friction. And your psi also shows an interesting behavior. So although psi is changing and uh, you have precision, but the rotation of the wheel or the top about the z-axis is not uniform. Your RPM does change, your psi dot does change. And I guess if you look back at this uh, video of Dr. Levin, if you look at the rate that the wheel is uh, spinning about the wheel, it's not, if you put it at the slow motion, you see it's not perfectly uh, uniform and constant uh, psi dot, okay? It does change a little bit, and as I said, it does depend on the amount of friction, okay? The less the friction, the more uniform the precision motion is going to be. So if I make it very small like this, you probably have a lot more stable motion.
for both the nutation and the precision like this okay but as i said it does depend on the friction and it does depend on how fast you are rotating this okay so if you're not rotating so fast then um the friction can show its effect a lot more as you can see here right or if i take one more zero okay so if you really want there we go if you really want to keep the nutation angle constant and the precision uniformly uh, increasing what you need is a huge rpm here so you have to spin it very fast and you have to minimize what the friction here and that's what they try to do on uh, gyros they put them on gimbals to minimize the friction to minimize the moment applied to them and they try to spin them very very fast this way they keep their orientation and they help you find the uh, amount of rotation of your aircraft or anything else that is using gyros okay so um Hopefully, I could clarify a little bit for you how a gyro works, how a um, uh, spinning top works, and how to use, in general, the uh, Euler angles for kinematics and kinetics of rigid bodies in 3D. Okay, long video. Thank you for staying with me. See you in the next lecture.